Good evening. I wonder if you ever looked for the constellation of Hydra, the water snake. It's actually the largest constellation in the sky, but there's not very much to it. It has only one fairly bright star, and that's called Alphard. And you can locate Alphard by using the twins, Castor and Pollux, as direction finders. Alphard's about as bright as the pole star, it's decidedly reddish, and it's very much on its own, so it's often nicknamed the solitary one. And there isn't very much to the rest of Hydra, which sprawls down below Leo and Virgo in the general direction of Libra, the scales or balance. And in Libra, at the present moment, we find Saturn, low in the southeast after dark, looking like a bright star. And I made a drawing of Saturn last night with my telescope, and there it is. Uh, the rings are wide open, and I don't think there's very much doubt that Saturn is the loveliest object in the entire sky. But this evening, I don't want to talk about Saturn. I want to turn to something very much less conspicuous in the same area of the sky. And these are some of the minor planets, or asteroids, which go around the sun between the paths of Mars and Jupiter. And there are several around that area. The brightest of them is Vesta, which you can see with binoculars as a star right point. Then there's Juno, considerably fainter. And down in Hydra, there is Amphitrite. And Amphitrite is of special interest at the moment. Here's a photograph of it. It's extremely faint. You need a telescope of some size to see it. It's indicated there on the edge of the arrow. I must say the arrow was put on afterwards. And Amphitrite is of special interest now because in the foreseeable future, it may be the very first asteroid to be bypassed by a space probe. And that's going to be tremendously exciting. But before coming on to that, a few words about the asteroids themselves. Any casual glance at a chart of the Sun's family, or solar system, shows that it's divided into two definite parts. There we have the Sun in the middle, and round it, the orbits of the small inner planets, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars. And beyond Mars, there comes a wide and very significant gap. We now know that the asteroids move there, the ancients didn't. And beyond that, we come to the first of the gas giants, which is Jupiter. But note that wide gap between the paths of Mars and Jupiter. In the 18th century, a very interesting mathematical relationship was drawn up, and is generally known as Bode's Law, because it was popularized by the German astronomer Johann Bode. And this linked the distances of the planets from the Sun in a very definite relationship. It worked very well out to Jupiter, it also worked very well for Saturn, the outermost planet known in ancient times. And then, in 1781, along came William Herschel, who was surveying the sky with his homemade telescope, when he discovered the next planet, the gas giant Uranus, uh, which is smaller than Jupiter and Saturn, but the same general type. You can just see it with the naked eye if you know where to look for it. And Uranus fitted in very nicely with Bode's law. And therefore, astronomers of the time came to the conclusion that it really was a law and not mere coincidence, and so there should be a planet moving in that big gap between Mars and Jupiter. Let me say here and now, I have no faith in Bode's law. Since then, we've had two more planetary discoveries, Neptune in 1846 and Pluto in 1930. And for them, Bode's law breaks down completely. And as Neptune is the third most massive in the solar system, and when a law breaks down like that, I think it ceases to be a law. There are the orbits, there's Neptune, and Pluto, whose orbit interlocks that of Neptune. So personally, I don't think myself that Bode's law is anything but coincidence. But it didn't look like that in the 18th century. And therefore, there should have been another planet between Mars and Jupiter. So, in 1800, a group of six astronomers met at the observatory of Johann Schroeter, Lilienthal near Bremen in Germany, and there's one of Schroeter's telescopes. They formed themselves into what they called the Celestial Police. They elected the Baron Franz Xavier von Zark as their secretary, and they set out to hunt for the new planet between Mars and Jupiter. Ironically, they were forestalled. At the observatory at Palermo, the director of the observatory in Sicily, Piazzi, was drawing up a star catalogue when he came across a star-like body which moved from one night to another. And if it moved, quite clearly, it could not be a star. It had to be something else. Piazzi thought it might be a planet. He was right, it was. He contacted the Celestial Police, and exactly a year later, in 1802, uh, Dr. Olbers, one of the police, discovered this new planet again in just the expected position. And Piazzi named it Ceres in honor of the patron goddess of Sicily. So once again, the solar system appeared to be complete, 
because Ceres did indeed go around the sun between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, just where Bode's law said it should be. The only snag was that Ceres didn't appear to be much of a planet. You can't see it with the naked eye, and it's very small, less than 700 miles in diameter. And that's small compared even with our moon, which is more than 2,000 miles across. There's the moon in the background, and there is Ceres. You can see the Ceres is pretty small. And the celestial police were not satisfied. If one small planet moved in that area, could there be more? And so they didn't give up, they went on hunting. And within the next few years, they discovered three more asteroids, Pallas, Juno, and Vesta. All those were much smaller than Ceres, and in fact, of the entire swarm, only Ceres, Pallas, and Vesta are more than 300 miles across. Well, that seemed to be all, and finally the police gave up. But in 1845, another asteroid was discovered, then another, then another, and gradually, discoveries came thick and fast. And by now, we know of more than 3,000 asteroids whose orbits have been worked out, so we can predict them. They're most of them are very small indeed, a few tens of miles in diameter or less, and some of the smaller ones are mere chunks of rocky material. But they are there, and the total number of asteroids must be several tens of thousands, I think. They are certainly not all alike. Of the four main ones, Vesta is the brightest, because it's the most reflective. But some of the others show very wide variations in albedo, or reflecting power. And to show what's meant, I went down last night to the seashore, and um, I collected some stones of different reflecting powers. Now, there's one whitey stone, reflecting about 40% of the light falling upon it, and that represents asteroid number 44, Nysa, which is quite reflective. And then look at the stone on the right. That represents the asteroid Arethusa, whose reflecting power is only about 2%, so it's blacker than a blackboard. And quite clearly, the asteroids are not all alike. They're very different kinds of bodies. They also spin round at different rates. We can tell that by the ways in which they vary in light. Ceres takes nine hours, Vesta over 10, and Florentina, a smaller asteroid, less than three hours. So once again, there's a very wide difference there. But what are their surfaces like? From Earth, we can't really tell. We can only see them as star-like points. But there may be a clue in the two dwarf moons or satellites of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, both of which are less than 30 miles in diameter, so they are asteroidal in size. And of course, they have been surveyed by the Mariner and the Viking probes. And there's a Viking picture of Phobos, the larger satellite, dark and crater scarred, and there is Deimos, the inner satellite. And it may well be that when they come to survey the asteroids, they'll look very like that. And it could be also, and I think this is quite likely, that Phobos and Deimos are not genuine moons of Mars, but used to be in the asteroid belt, and were simply captured by the gravitational pull of Mars long ago. And so they are ex-asteroids, not genuine satellites. I think that's probably the case. But how soon will we find out? And this is where we come back to Amphitrite. Now, Amphitrite is a medium-sized asteroid, diameter 158 miles, so far as we can tell. And when you compare that with a map of England, you can see that although by planetary standards it's extremely small, uh, by English standards it's quite big. It'll stretch from the Thames one side to the Severn the other. Though, of course, we've no absolute guarantee it's regular in form. It may not be. I mean, Juno, for example, is egg-shaped. Well, uh, we now know also its orbit. It goes round right in the middle of the asteroid belt. There's its orbit, shown there in green. And the distance of the Sun varies between 220 and 253 million miles, and the year is four times as long as ours. But, of course, it's always pretty faint because it is so small. I've got a telescope in my own observatory, the one I used to make that drawing of Saturn I showed you just now, and um, I do, in fact, take photographs. But I have difficulty in that part of the sky where Amphitrite now is. There's some artificial light glow there. I call it Aurora Bogner Regis. And anyway, Ron Arbour of the British Astronomical Association, who has a similar kind of telescope, is a very much better photographer than I am, and so I asked him to photograph Amphitrite for this program, and this is what he produced. There's Amphitrite, again shown on the end of the arrow. And that's just about as much as you're going to see, so long as you have to observe from the Earth's surface. So, what are we going to find out in the near future? Well, we may find out a good deal. The Galileo probe to Jupiter will bypass Amphitrite. Now, there is a NASA impression of the Galileo probe being launched from the Space Shuttle. Its main target is Jupiter, but obviously it's got to go through the asteroid belt, 
and luckily it can be programmed to go close to Amphitrite. So let's have a look at the track of the Galileo probe. It'll be launched uh, in 1986, May. It'll go past Amphitrite in December 1986, a distance of only about 6,000 miles, when it'll then be 236 million miles from the Earth. And if all is well, it will photograph the surface of Amphitrite and show features down to less than two miles in diameter. Of course, it'll be a flyby. It'll then go on to reach Jupiter. It'll do that in 1988, and there'll be an entry probe and an orbital probe, and I'll have a great deal more to say about it by that time. But meanwhile, it should have told us something about Amphitrite. And I just wonder, what's Amphitrite going to be like? And there's an impression by Paul Doherty of the rocky cratered surface, and I wonder if it really is like that. We will see the familiar constellations, of course, but there will be some extra objects there, because don't forget, Amphitrite is right in the middle of the asteroid zone, and there are very many other asteroids moving around, and they look like brighty stars in the Amphitrite sky. And I think it'll be absolutely fascinating to see uh, what that probe tells us. Now, so far, I've been talking about asteroids that keep to the main zone between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. But not all of them do that. There are some which swing inward and can come quite close to the Earth. And the first discovered of these was Eros, discovered by Witter in Berlin in 1898. And there's a photograph of Eros on the end of the direction indicator there. And the two bright stars are actually the twins, Castor and Pollux. Now, Eros is small. It's about 20 miles long and rather less than 10 miles broad, so it's shaped rather like a cosmic sausage. Whether the surface features are like that, of course, we don't know, but they could be. But the interesting point is that it swings right inside the orbit of Mars. There we have the orbits of Earth and Mars. There is Eros. And when it comes close to us, as it did in 1931 and again in 1975, it can approach the Earth to within 16 million miles, and you can then see it with binoculars. And that was the first of the so-called inner asteroids. Plenty more have been discovered since then. The holder of the approach record is Hermes. And Hermes' orbit brings it well inside that of the Earth. And in 1937, Hermes actually bypassed us at less than half a million miles, only 485,000. And that caused some rather interesting newspaper headlines when the news came out. There is one. Earth escapes from collision. Minor planet missed by five and a half hours. Although, in point of fact, there was no danger that Hermes at that stage would hit us. Then there is Icarus. And Icarus is rather different. Here's a photograph of it. The stars are shown as points. And Icarus is a trail because this was a time exposure. And Icarus was moving quite noticeably across the plate. And the interesting point about that is that the orbit carries it inside that of Mercury. So at perihelion, or closer to the Sun, it's less than 16 million miles from the Sun. It's no longer unique. In 1983, IRS, the Infrared Astronomical Satellite, discovered the minor planet known for a long time as 1983 TB, and now, I think, going to be named Phaethon. And that goes even closer into the Sun than Icarus does. So at perihelion, it must be red hot. And I just wonder whether Phaethon then will look anything like this. Certainly, it and Icarus must have two of the most uncomfortable climates in the entire solar system. They are, of course, very small. And I just wonder whether there's any real difference between an asteroid and a meteorite. And very probably, the answer is no. Consider the meteor crater in Arizona. That was made by a missile which hit the Arizonan desert more than 22,000 years ago. And you can call that missile either a small asteroid or a large meteorite. I think the two bodies are probably the same, and meteorites probably do come from the asteroid belt. And now and then, of course, we must be hit by a major asteroid. There's even a suggestion that a major asteroid collision about 65 million years ago caused such a tremendous change in our climates that the dinosaurs, who had ruled the world for so long, simply couldn't adapt and died out. I must admit I'm a bit sceptical about that theory, but there is a certain amount of evidence for it, and it's certainly got to be taken very seriously. But just as there are asteroids coming inside the orbits of the Earth and Mars, so there are asteroids further out. There are, for example, the Trojan asteroids, and they move in the same orbit as Jupiter, but they keep prudently either well ahead or well behind, so they're in no danger of being sucked in. By asteroidal standards, they are fairly large, Although, of course, they are faint because they're so far away. And one of them, Hector, 
There is light in a rather strange manner, and it's thought quite likely that Hector may be either double or dumbbell-shaped or elongated. And that's an impression of what Hector may be like, although to find out definitely, obviously, we've got to wait for a space probe. Then there are other asteroids with almost cometary orbits. Consider number 944, Hidalgo. And that goes from the inner part of the solar system out almost as far as Saturn. And in 1977, Charles Coel discovered Chiron. And that spends most of its time between the orbits of Saturn and Uranus. And it takes 50 years to go around the sun. And there's a trail left by Chiron on a photographic plate. But Chiron, by asteroidal standards, is large. It's probably several hundred miles in diameter and appears to be fairly darkish. So it really is very much of an oddity. And then, what about Pluto? Or rather, Pluto and its satellite, which go around the sun together. Now, Pluto's orbit interlocks that of Neptune, though there's no faint idea of a collision because the two are very much inclined to each other. But Pluto is smaller than our moon. Its own satellite is smaller still. And so I think there's now a very good reason for taking Pluto and its satellite, Charon, to be a double asteroid. There's a picture taken with an electronic device from Hawaii. Uh, Pluto's over to the left. That bar through the middle is, of course, purely an instrumental effect, and Charon is over to the right. Please don't confuse Charon with Chiron, the asteroidal object discovered by Coel. It's a picture the two names are so alike. But if Pluto and its satellite make up a double asteroid, there's every chance, I think, there may be other bodies of the same kind moving in the far parts of the solar system, and there may be a whole swarm of asteroidal bodies out there. And even in the main asteroid belt, we have some asteroids which appear to be double. Herculina is one that may well have a satellite. And so I think the asteroids are spread quite widely through the solar system, and they're very much more interesting than we used to think. Mind you, they've not always been popular members of the solar system, because very often, when you take a photographic plate, you find it's trawling with asteroid trails. And you can see some of them on this photograph, which wasn't taken to photograph asteroids at all. And one irritated German astronomer even went so far as to refer to them as vermin of the skies, which I think is most unkind. But, you know, they are of special interest, and we don't even know quite how they got there. There was a theory, current for some time, that the asteroids are the remains of an old planet, or planets, that broke up in the remote past, either by exploding in some way or by collision. But I think it's very much more likely that the asteroids are simply material left over when the main planets were formed, and no major planet could form in that area because mighty Jupiter was already there, and Jupiter would break up any large planet that tried to get together. And so all we see in place of one large planet are large numbers of small ones. And that, I think, is a much more likely answer to the asteroid belt. Finally, I can't resist showing you asteroid 2602, discovered by Dr. Edward Bowell some years ago at the Lowell Observatory in Arizona. It's the privilege of a discoverer to name his asteroid. And Dr. Bowell paid me the great compliment of naming this one after me. And so there is asteroid 2602, now known officially as Moore. And um, to quote Clyde Tombaugh years ago, at least I now have a piece of real estate that no one can touch, even though it's less than five miles in diameter, it's near the edge of the asteroid belt, and is so faint that with my telescope I can't see it at all. But it is there. And you know, I would hate to dismiss asteroid 2602 as being merely a piece of vermin in the skies. Good night. That edition of A Sky at Night will be shown again next Saturday evening on BBC Two at 20 past six.